All right, welcome everybody to lecture 23. This is week 12. Costing energy, let's just take a little peek, update at the syllabus. I also want to take this opportunity just to thank everybody who's you know not here in the classroom listening online for, for sticking with it. I know a lot of times it's, it can be, um, it, it's sometimes tough to self-motivate to go in like, okay, I'm going to log in, watch another <laughs> YouTube video. That's my, my college experience, but it's, it's kind of where education is these days. And I guess we're, you know, we're doing our best here to uh, provide a good service, so hopefully it's paying off. I also do want to say, um, right now I'm in the process with my colleagues in, in my department of going through what's called IPR, so uh, Individual Performance Review, and there, we've put this thing to call, together called the FEC, it's the Faculty Evaluation Committee. So what ends up happening is, um, you know, as, as professors come through universities, they're either tenure track or non-tenure track. So my, my position is tenure track. I'm going up for tenure. And so what my colleagues are doing right now, they're, they're sort of sifting through all the student comments. They're sifting through papers I've, I've published, um, community events I've been involved with, et cetera. And it, it's really important that you do turn in your uh, teaching evaluations at the end of the semester. They know some professors won't even let you get a grade unless you do it. I'm not that way. But the other thing I, I want to say is when you're filling these things out, um, try to say at least one thing nice. <laughs> even if you want to say something really crappy and horrible, uh, you, should, you should say at least one thing positive. I mean, I, I got a comment from somebody. Um, I, I still do not know who it is, but they went through a full semester with our Shell Eco Marathon team. I mean, granted, we were in the engineering phases rather than the materials purchasing and build phase. But the person wrote on the evaluation, I went through a full semester and I still don't know anything about electric cars. I'm like, anything? Like, if I'd quit, like, did they have wheels? I mean, did, they, did they burn gasoline? I mean, so <laughs> to, to say something like that, it, it's, um, well, first of all, it's not true. <laughs> And it's counterproductive. If you have some criticism to make, you know, make constructive criticism <coughs> so that the course gets better. Don't take out some personal vendetta against your professor, or unless unless he's gotten personal with you. But um, you know, we're just we're just humans here, doing our best. So um, if you're going to have some constructive criticism, also say what you liked about the class too, and what you liked about the instructors, or professors, um, style. Okay. So let's look down at the syllabus. And yeah, we're getting really close to the end here. Uh, it's week. <laughs> yeah, so week 12. So we're going to get into the last three chapters, 12, 13, 14. I also want to let you know, Tim's going to give lecture a week from today. I got a nice call excuse me, from Carl Little recently. He uh, works at NCAT, so the National Center for Appropriate Technology in Butte. Um, his specialty at Butte is sustainable agriculture. So you guys probably knew this a few years ago when uh, petroleum prices were increasing, there were some federal subsidies to, to turn um, corn into ethanol. That's proved to be very controversial and have a very low, if even a positive, uh, energy return on investment. It ends up with a lot of environmental degradation, overuse of water for you know relatively little gain. And unfortunately, so, so, so well, fortunately or unfortunately, you know that type of research has lost economic favorability in light of the current petroleum prices, you know, with gasoline being uh, less expensive than it previously was. However, um, I, I think, I think we're, we're all starting to realize what a valuable resource our soils are. You know, we, I, I think going back to um, that first lecture and looking at the, the rate at which we're extracting, uh, you know, really old biomass from the planet, 
you can also sort of look at, at soil as being something that didn't, didn't show up. I mean, the, the, the planet, I mean, you, unless you're a creationist, I mean, the planet was not just created with a whole bunch of sweet dirt on it. I mean, that, that, that dirt was the, was the result of, of glaciation, of, of forests growing and dying, of uh, microorganisms chewing their way through bunches of, you know, biomass, uh, sand and silt getting mixed in. So that stuff uh, took a long time to, to, to be built. So the folks at NCAT are really looking at how do we uh, preserve, maintain, create, sustain uh, soils uh, on the North American continent because if you think um, energy security is a big deal, uh, try food security, a uh, really big deal. So anyway, Carl and I are going to sit down a week from Tuesday. We'll have, we'll have lunch together because what he's looking for are local biomass experts. There's a process called torification, and I'm, I'm not that much of an expert in it, but I'd like to learn more about it. And what I, what I hope to do is put Carl in closer contact with guys like Brian Kearns. If you haven't had, a, I mean, if you haven't had Brian Kearns courses yet, you're, you have something special to look forward to. He teaches our alternative fuels and our biofuels courses. Um, also, uh, Mike Holacek of Algae Aquatech is a, is a biomass, biochemist expert. Hoping to put him in touch with, with uh, Carl as well. And then one of our other grads, if you haven't met him, uh, hopefully you have the chance, really neat guy, Reeve Tunnell, works out at Blue Marble Biomass, uh, doing a great job out there. But he's kind of in the process of looking for more of a, a startup type environment so hopefully we get we get something going there in the in the sustainable agriculture field and that energy technology could be could be part of that okay so that said I won't be here Tim Chester is going to give you a little um, uh, problem again uh, and he's gonna what he's gonna do is gonna look at costing coal versus natural gas so that's something to look forward to and if I understand correctly, he's going to throw a um, cost of emissions into the equation too. So what is it? You know, what does it cost? What kind of penalty might be put in place for emitting CO2 into the atmosphere? If I understand correctly, Northwestern Energy is going to start moving towards that model where they, and again, it's like, are they penalizing themselves, <laughs> or are they penalizing? the consumer for carbon emissions. And you, you, you probably have also heard, this, this also has a lot to do with what we're going to talk about today, you probably also have heard that Northwestern Energy has a program, and I, I have not researched it, I've merely heard it on the radio, where customers can pay a premium for renewable energy uh, infrastructure. So if you know, you're, you're, and they also have another program where you can, you can give, well, I don't know if it's Northwest Energy, there are programs where a wealthy, conscientious person can pay money into a pool that allows a, you know, less financially capable person to have better heat for the winter, for example. So, it, you know, it becomes a, a system with, you know, the utility sort of sitting there in the middle, brokering, you know, megajoules coming in one side, dollars coming in the other, CO2 flying out the other one. So it, it, it doesn't end up being a lot more complex than you might think at, at, at first sight. Um, so what Tim's going to do is, is go over what the, you know, if carbon emissions end up being capped, taxed, regulated, et cetera, et cetera, what, it'll, what that will do to the economics of the energy grid. So look, so look forward to that. Uh, what else? Um, summary five. Have I have I shown you summary five at all yet? Okay, maybe I'll just do that. And then, any any questions about problem set two? Is that okay? Is it there? Um, has anyone started it? Have you seen it? Yeah, I pulled it up, but I didn't. I don't remember it. But it's there. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's okay. Problem set. So, so problem set. So, do take a look at problem set two. Um, 
It just so happens to be due this week. I mean, it, you, you've got a week to finish it, so get, get problem set due in, or problem set two finished by uh, a week from now. Take a look at it between now and Thursday, so that if you have any questions, we can, I can answer them for you on Thursday, or email them to me. And then, um, summary five, I guess you'll have that to do over Thanksgiving break. Well, that said, let's take a look at the last, the last couple of weeks here, uh, because Thanksgiving kind of throws a little bit of a wrench in the, the scheduling, scheduling works. And I just, just as soon answer those questions right now. Okay, so this is week 12. Um, <clears throat> Thanksgiving is more or less week 13. Uh, um, this, this stuff right here basically isn't going to uh, happen. We won't, we won't have a um, lecture on Thursday, obviously. Um, this is what I have penciled in as week 14. <clears throat> and this is more or less week 15. I've got the last day of class right here on December 11th. Now, typically, um, there are only 28 lectures per semester. There really only are 14 weeks. So we kind of have 14 and a half, more or less. So, you, so we might think of this December 7th as being week 14. So let's just, let's, just, let's just call it that. In fact, I'll, I'll come back here. Let's see if I can just edit this guy. Yeah, so instead of week 14 starting then, it'll start. Um, oops, what am I doing here? Um, I had this is 13, I had this is 14. Let's go. So this is week 14, right? Okay. File, save, file, close. And then if we go back here, um, you guys have probably all been in elevators in tall buildings where there is no floor 13. <laughs> so. Thanksgiving is, is, the, is the, the 13th week that didn't happen, but anyway, thir um, the week following will be week, week 13, so let me just make that change too, according to my little schedule here. Okay, so uh, next week will be week 12.5 or, or something like that. Um, there's week 13, Monday, perfect, it starts. Um, there's week 14, last day of classes in the 11th, and then here's finals week. And I'll just reiterate right now, the final itself is, and I, I, I know we have a time scheduled for it, I'll make sure that I get you, um, get you the time. If you wanna come in and take it face to face, we'll be here, I can print it out, I can answer questions during the final. Um, I also, keep my cell phone on if you're traveling over finals week and want to take it over the period it's due. I usually, I usually put it out there for a full day, you know, since it's an online course and, you know, people are traveling or have other finals. I give you at least 24 hours to take it, you know, so I'll open it at noon on one day and, and close it at noon on the next. So, but I will be sitting here during our official final schedule to answer questions, you know, you're either in person or over the phone or online, take, take your pick. Um, it, it's, it's a bonus. You don't have to take it. I think it's a lot of fun. People like it. If you score better on the final than you did on one of your other exams, then the final replaces that exam score and so your grade can only go up. Okay. Let's, let's see if we can't find summary five. And if I can't, we'll just get into the, into the lecture.
Yeah, I'll take a look for it over break. I don't, I, don't, I don't see it right off the top of my head. So, okay. Well, let's just go ahead and get into chapter 12 then. So, costing energy. They start off kind of a, you know, pretty straightforward figure. This is something that we're all intimately familiar with. Uh, this, these are the, the costs of fuel at the pump. So we're looking at pence per liter. And so 50 cents a liter is about four bucks a gallon. And when this guy was, when this book was published, fuel prices were in fact higher. Now if we look, um, the, the, there's almost no difference in terms of dollars per gallon or pence per liter for the for the fuel price. Um, the the discrepancies that we're seeing there um, are in the in the taxes. So a lot of people say, hey, there's there's so much um, so much tax, we got to get rid of the tax. Well, compared to what other countries pay, it's 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 pretty trivial. There was not um, there was not data. Um, from China and India, so there, there is a red line in here somewhere. The authors just did not have access to that data. And a, and a lot of times, the, you know, since uh, China is not, well, it is and it isn't. It's not really a, a pure capitalistic society, it's, you know, communistic society. They're not, they don't uh, see the, the, the value and the transparency of, of prices and costs. I mean, it's just not published. and. Uh, India, I, I just I don't know how to do their accounting, but maybe some more issues there. Okay. Another thing to mention, since we're looking here at Figure 12.1, let's also take a look at Box 12.1. And I know we've done a lot of units conversion in the class. You know, converting uh, megajoules, gigajoules, kilowatt hours, BTUs, calories, what have you. Uh, among each other. Uh, therms is another uh, uh, another metric. What we can see here though is that what, what the authors are talking about is the fact that electricity has always been sold in the, in the kilowatt hour. Um, petroleum, you, you're not going to say, hey, I, I want uh, 10, 10 megajoules of gasoline, please. You're going to say, I want this many gallons of gasoline. Uh, different gasoline grades have different energy contents. Um, and, and it's not necessarily just the energy content. It's also going to be a function of the efficiency with which that particular fuel burns in a given engine. So what, what might be a, a, a very high efficiency fuel for one engine is not for another one. So there's, nev there's never one exact answer to the, the cost of energy in this case. Coal is sold by the by the um, um, prudent mass by weight. You know, it, it's weighed because the, with uh, coal, you can see how it might there might be an issue depending on how coarsely or finely it's ground. The the density is going to change, so it's just it's fairer to charge by the weight because you know in a coal truck, you know maybe gosh as much as 20% of it might be air. Right? It's just it's just voids in between the chunks. So um, that's the that's the reason why different forms of energy are sold with different units. Okay. Uh, there's also a mention here. This is kind of neat. Um, a hundred and forty dollars per barrel in two thousand eight. That was a um, historic high. And as we've mentioned, there are a lot of different factors that go into that. You know, how many rigs are running, uh, how far it has to be shipped what type of mon monopolies and cartels are in place. Um, and also just, gosh, the, the, the size of the vehicles that are on the roads. I, I remember, in fact, it was, it was 2008, and I was living in Philadelphia, and I had a little uh, pedicab. It wasn't really a company, but let me, let me show you guys this. Oh, here it is. Um, So I, I, I had this little pedicab. So there I am, running, running the kids around in a, in a parade. 
And it, it, this is a human electric hybrid, so it's got pedals, but it's also got a little throttle. So there's an electric motor in there, a few batteries, built in England. And it was a good economic lesson for me because I learned that unless people were told how much to pay, they're almost always going to underpay. I gave a, I gave a lady a ride um, two or three miles through Philadelphia. She was in the, sitting in the back seat exchanging dollars and, and yens. You know, she's doing international currency trading. I could overhear her conversation. And she was actually mildly horrified that another human being was actually moving her around. I said, well, no, it's got a, it's got a motor. I'm just exercising up here. Uh, but then when she, <laughs> when she asked how much um, the, the ride was, I said, well, you know, I'm just doing a little experiment. Why don't you pay me what you feel it's worth? She gave me like five bucks. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Five bucks. Uh, you know, had had she been in a, in a ta you know petroleum powered taxi cab, she, you know she would have paid what the fare was, and it would have been much closer to twenty twenty five dollars for for that distance. So, again, there's a little lesson in costing energy. You know, what what is your human slave labor power? <laughs> Not a hell of a heck of a lot. I guess the price would have went up if you had went for how long? Well, um, nah. I mean, you're, you're right. The ta um, taxi cab fare is a function of time and distance, and it, it is in this case, but I don't, I don't think that was really... Anyway, cross her mind. My, my point was, though, um, I, was, I had a nice little partnership with a Toyota dealer there in, um, just outside of Philadelphia. It, they were sponsoring some of our uh, human-powered vehicle competitions and some of our... Uh, electric car and solar car builds we were doing there at Drexel University. And um, in 2008, there's all these, you know, giant hulking vehicles sitting there on the lot because everyone, you know, saw, like, there's no way I could afford to put gasoline in that thing. And they couldn't make the Prius fast enough. So, you know, the, the, the consumer market is just so volatile. It was really a, a, a big eye-opener and a lesson for me on how short-sighted we are in, in, in so many ways. Okay, so there's fuel. Um, we're looking at com comparison of domestic fuel prices. And this, this should not really come as a heck of a lot of surprise. If you're going to take um, NRGY 235 in the spring, and I know a few of you are, um, actually, if you're, if you're planning on taking 235, you're actually going to sign up for John Freer's CSTN 283. He teaches a green carpentry uh, class, and his 283, the learning objectives are almost identical to what we teach in 235. So he's going to give the majority of the lectures. I'm going to come in and go give some of the theory. Uh, Lagan Todd, who uh, does a lot of the commissioning on retrofits for federal buildings in the state of Montana is going to give some lectures, and um, Zandy Seavers, who is a passive house expert, is going to give one or two. So it should be a, should be a really cool course. Anyway, what, what we, one thing we do cover, certainly in building energy efficiency, is the cost of heating one's home. And that's really what's going on here. So you can see um, we still, even though we might complain about how much things cost, have it pretty dang good compared to the rest of the world. Um, Denmark, UK, France all pay more for each of their different fuels. And, and, and there are a variety of reasons for this. I, I, I tend to think, and I, I could be wrong, it's just my little mechanical engineering brain talking here, but that it, it really has a lot to do with the amount of time that Western civilization has inhabited these different parts of the world. So, the longer humans have been in a given place extracting resources, the fewer of them there are and the more expensive they become. Uh, we are quite blessed with uh, on the, you know, a fairly sparse population in North America and fairly advanced techniques for getting to our natural resources and we are uh, reaping the benefits uh, in, in, in terms of cost as shown in this figure. Uh, one thing I did in my house recently was to take out my electric stove. As you can see right there, and this is on a um, kilowatt hour basis. 
It could also be on a megajoule basis, right? So a kilowatt hour comes into your house as electricity, it's, it's 3.6 uh, megajoules of energy came in. Just came in, you know, call them kilowatt hours, and that's how much energy came into your house to, to heat up the air in your house, right? To make it hotter. You do the same thing with oil by burning oil in the house, and there, you don't see too many heating oil furnaces. I think there are a few in some of the public schools in, in Montana still, believe it or not. But as you see here, uh, gas is, um, is a lot cheaper. Why is that? Well, when we cover electricity, you've got to, you know, you got to set, you've got to dig the coal up, you got to set it on fire, you've got to um, expand some steam, you got to take that steam, run it through a generator, that generator's got to keep spinning, spinning a magnet, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of technology going to make each one of those kilowatt hours of electricity that you simply don't have in gas. You know, you, you, I mean, obviously, the, the fracking technology is, is quite uh, sophisticated, but once it's in the pipeline, you set it on fire and it heats your house. <laughs> you know, so it's you know, rel relatively simple and, in, in some ways, more efficient um, than electricity or oil. And I, also, I did the same thing. I, re I replaced my electric dryer with a gas dryer. What I would love to do ultimately, and this is kind of my little fantasy pipe dream down the future. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a, uh, a meeting with the Five Valleys High Performance Building Council in, a, in a, well, a few weeks. What I would love to do is just take carbon out of the equation entirely. I would love to have enough solar on my house and enough water coming into it. And I'm actually looking up in the rattlesnake right now and I can see some of that some of that water is probably going to end up in my in my street uh, come spring. It's 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 frozen as in the form of snow, but I would love to be able to take some of that water and some of the sunlight that hits my rooftop and just make hydrogen. I'd, I'd much rather have a hydrogen stove and a hydrogen dryer and just just get rid of the, the whole carbon thing entirely. And that in that way, you're not uh, you know you're not sending CO2 into the air to keep your house warm. That's, that's down the road, and we'll talk about that more. As the, actually, we'll talk about that a lot more in uh, NRG 102 near the end of the semester. What's the cost for a conversion process on that for your dryer and your to make it where it can run off of hydrogen? Oh, well, it, it's a great question. I don't know the, the cost of conversion. Um, I have not seen a commercial hydrogen appliance like I just described. Although we, uh, our little energy technology posse here, we are fortunate enough to have people like Mark Broston among our alumni. Uh, Broston lives up in the Flathead um, and has developed, actually is, is right now working on a um, hydrogen valve uh, to, to do exactly what I, what I mentioned. You know, the, the gas is much, um, well, it's much more flammable. The molecules are smaller. Uh, hydrogen tends to Im embrittle any material, any metal that it uh, comes into contact with, it, it just it, it it's so small it sort of gets in between the the metal lattice, and so it, it's not a it's not a, it's a soft problem. And people have figured it out, but um, yeah, it's a good question. I, you can't you can't really go buy one now. It would have to be something that uh, have to be developed, uh, inspected, UL listed, et cetera, et cetera, before it was. Uh, Allowed to be in, you know, like an Energy Star rated thing in your in your house, but um, UL. What's that stand for? UL is Underwriters Laboratory. You'll see the little UL sometimes stuck on the different. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so there's a you know comparison of different energy sources. All right, and this is this is for residential. Now what we're looking at is uh, UK recent trends in industrial energy prices. As it says in the book, industrial energy prices are usually far lower than those for the domestic consumer. They also tend to be far closer to the world average prices for globally traded commodities such as coal and oil. And so we're looking at 12, uh, figure 12.3. And in general, they go up. Uh, this, this is the... And I guess what, I, what we need to know, what we need to know is if these prices count for inflation or not. 
There's no tax. It, it, does, it does say that uh, the most remarkable feature of the chart, uh, you can see the coal is kind of there at the bottom, is how the prices of coal, gas, which is just above it there in green, and heavy fuel oil, which is there in um, purple, uh, says they have diverged substantially. It said uh, by 2009, UK coal, uh, coal prices increased just slightly. Uh, two pounds per gigajoule, uh, largely determined by imports. Uh, it, all these things started out low and right, right together in 1998. <coughs> North Sea gas was um, very plentiful, not, not so much anymore. Uh, light fuel oil, the same deal, not so much anymore. But then this is, this is also interesting, right at the bottom of the page, they say, somewhat strangely, despite rising gas prices, UK electricity prices to large consumers actually fell, uh, going from, what were they, uh, $8.10 pence per gigajoule uh, in 1998. And then we're looking at six pounds seventy in two thousand two. Well, yeah, there's a, there's a big dip there from ninety eight to ninety two. Says it's likely to have been due to fierce competition with the electricity market, which cut profits. So it wasn't it wasn't a matter of there wasn't enough electricity or coal to go around. It was just people were competing. And um, I, I I frequently think that if, for example, the um, the, the landfill, the, that re, if, if Republic had to compete with another landfill or waste disposal service, their, their prices would kind of, kind of come down because they can just kind of keep rising them, rising it, you know, and no one's going to say, oh, well, I'll just, well, very few people will say, oh, I'll, I'll just quit throwing things away. I'll, I'll quit using the garbage. I mean, I, I've managed to do it. It hasn't been easy, but um, the, the little dip right here that we're looking at in the middle was just due to competition. You know, the, the monopolies, the, all, uh, um, the uh, larger suppliers just were, just were sort of forced to not have as, as great of a profit, you know? Just, um, couldn't have a greater profit because there were competition. So a lot of different things can affect prices. And I'm still not sure if this is in constant dollars or in uh, inflation if it accounts for inflation or not. All right, let's take a little break there and then we'll get into 12.3.